said, what God is revealing to me is that Satan is gathering his forces. Wow, that scared me. Now, let me make two points on this. Number one, if you're one of those that thinks that Satan was created in Hollywood, you are wrong. This same book that tells you about God tells you about Satan. He is real. He is alive. And the best thing that could happen for him is that we believe he was created in Hollywood and he's not a real entity. He is the enemy. Peter says he's like a roaring lion walking about looking for whom he might devour. Satan is real. And the second point is don't trifle with him. Don't trifle with him. And I said, Mom, I, I don't want to be part of anything that Satan has his hands on. My mother said, Son, I don't know what it means. I don't know what it means. And that next morning, I went to the little church I grew up in. The little church I grew up in was a little country church there in North Carolina. And it wasn't even as big as this center section right here. And I got down on my knees. And it was one of those churches that had wooden pews. Do you remember? You ever been in a church with wooden pews? You ever try to sleep on one of those wooden pews? That's why this, they had made them out of wood so you couldn't sleep. I got down on my knees that morning, and the Bible says, you'll, you'll seek me and find me when you seek me with what? All your heart. All your heart. And I needed to know, God, do you want me to be part of this unit or not? Tell me before I go back to Fort Bank. I got down on my knees. I said, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Satan is gathering his forces. God, show me what to do. And as I was saying, Satan is gathering his forces. For the first time in my life, I heard the audible voice of God. And you can say, oh, you hear little voices? No, it was a big voice. Now, I don't think anybody around me heard it, but I heard the voice of the Lord in a way that was audible to me. As I said, Satan is gathering his forces. And the voice of the Lord said, yes, son, but so am I. And I knew I was to go back. <laughs> I knew I was to go back and be part of that, this new organization. The next morning, I sat in a chair, and, and the old colonel that founded the Delta Force was a guy named Charlie Beckwith. He was a notorious Green Beret. He had been shot in the belly with a 50 caliber and survived it. Yeah. <clears throat> and he sat there. He was an old Georgia football player. He was sitting there, a great big old guy, and he had his some of his non-commissioned officers and officers sitting in a semicircle, and they were hammering me with questions. There were no right and wrong answers. They were just trying to intimidate me, see what I was made of, and I was just giving them responses as the Holy Spirit gave me utterance. That's scriptural. That's what the Bible says. Don't worry about what to say. The Holy Spirit will give you utterance. And I just, I just gave them responses. And all of a sudden, old Colonel Charlie Beckwith, he looked at all the guys there and he said, all right, everybody stop. Just yes, stop. He said, Captain Boykin, you're a pretty religious fella, ain't you? Now, let me make a point here. I am not religious. And the fact is, I, I, I grew up in such a religious legalistic environment that it really I, I was away from the Lord for for many years because everything that looked good sounded good smelled good or tasted good was a sin everything and life was not enjoyable but I came back to the Lord and I realized that it's about his grace it is about God's grace and uh and I looked at Colonel Beckwith and I said I said yeah Colonel I am and he said were you raised that way I said, well, my mother's a saint. And this this old cantankerous old colonel, hard drinking, hard cursing, hard living guy, he looked at me and he said, my mother was the same way. He said, we'd be glad to have you here in the Delta Force. Yeah. And all I could think of was, well, I knew that yesterday. You're a day late, bro. But let me tell you something. For the next two years, old Colonel Beckwith treated me with contempt. I actually thought he hated me. He treated me worse than any of his officers. It was only years later that I was able to figure out why. You know what it was? I said I was a Christian. And he had a standard that he wanted me to meet. And he had seen Christians before. He had served with men before that said, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian. And then they compromised. 
and compromised on fundamental issues that he knew to be biblical. And he treated me with contempt because he was testing me to see if I was really a Christian. And I was, I was on the verge of just leaving because he treated me with such contempt. But then on the night of the 23rd of April, 1980, we were standing in an old Russian MiG base in a place called Wadi Kenya, Egypt. We were there in that desert because President Jimmy Carter was sending us into Tehran, Iran to rescue 52 Americans that were being held by the followers of the Ayatollah Khomeini at the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, Iran. And Charlie Beckwith came up to me that night and he said, Jerry, before we launch this operation tomorrow morning, will you get these men together and will you pray? And ask God to be with us. And that's when I realized I'd met his standard. I'd passed his test. He accepted that I really was a Christian. And I said, of course, Colonel, I will in the next morning. And there's actually a picture of this that I did not know existed until two years ago. And somebody put it on the Internet. I'm standing on a platform in that hangar in civilian. We, we all wore blue jeans. and We went in in civilian clothes. We all had dog tags and an ID card to make us legal, but we went in in civilian clothes. And there we are. We're all standing around this platform that I'm standing on as I'm praying before this event. We started out by reading Isaiah 6, 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. God's still asking that question. Just like what he says in Psalms. Who will rise up against this evil for me? He's saying, who will go for me? And that's up to us to decide whether we're one that will say, here my Lord, send me. And then we began to pray. I led the prayer, and that's what's in the photograph. It's on my website, but you can find it on the Internet, too. And I led the prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we're going into a city of 5 million people, and there's only 100 of us, Lord. It is honored by your grace and mercy that we will survive to come home to our families. Please keep your hands upon us and bring us home safely. In Jesus' name, and then you know what we did? We all sang God Bless America right there in that hangar. We launched that operation. About 18 hours later, we landed about 100 miles from Tehran out in the middle of the desert. Very dark night. We landed in uh, C-130s. And then we brought uh, RH-53 helicopters, big jolly green giants off the USS Nimitz. And they came in behind the C-130s and the helicopters would tuck in behind the C-130 on the ground there. And we rolled hoses out and we started refueling those helicopters. And, and finally, when they were all refueled, one of the helicopters lifted off, getting ready to, to reposition so we could go into the embassy to get our fellow Americans out. And as he lifted off, the sand blew up and he just went vertigo. He, he lost his equilibrium. And as he lifted up, all of a sudden, he, he couldn't hold it. He couldn't hold it. Bam, he came right down on top of the C-130. It was closer than from here to the back of the church. And I was walking towards it there in the pitch black of the night. And all of a sudden, there was this huge fireball. And I could feel the heat from this fireball. And I turned and started to run. And when I turned and started to run, I just felt that still small voice that the bible talks about it says stop stop i stopped and i turned around and when i looked that's when i realized that 45 of those men that had stood in the desert in wadi kenya egypt and prayed were trapped hopelessly inside that c-130 could not get out and that they were going to die and the only thing that i could do was go back to my source In this book that I wrote with Stu Weber, there's a chapter in here called The Power of a 10-Second Prayer. And it's about what I'm telling you right now. You know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees prayed these long, elaborate prayers. But who were they praying to? They were praying to the people around them. They were praying for the benefit of the people around them. And when somebody tells me, I don't know how to pray, I say, yes, you do. You know how to talk? Even if it's sign language, God understands your heart. He's reading your heart. The words are less important than what's in your heart. I'm telling you guys, don't ever think that God's not hearing you because you don't know how you're not eloquent in your prayers. I'm not eloquent in my prayers, but God knows my heart. 
And I stood there and I looked at that burning wreckage and I said, God, in the name of Jesus, these men trusted you, Lord. I'm asking you to bring them out alive. God, don't let them die in Jesus' name. 